Welcome to Washington to TR2 World's special look at the upcoming meeting between Presidents Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Donald Trump. Hello, I'm Ali Can Ayanlar. On November 13th, the Turkish President will be meeting with Donald Trump at the White House. And over the next half hour, we'll be looking at what we can expect from this meeting. I'm joined by Luke Coffey. Luke is a director over at the Heritage Foundation. He's also a former advisor to the UK Ministry of Defense, as well as a US Army veteran. And Ali Çınar, who is the president of the Turkish Heritage Organization. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Well, it's no secret that Ankara and Washington have enjoyed better days, and this visit does come at a time when tensions are running high. So where and how did relations between these two NATO allies start to deteriorate, and how much can be really salvaged? And what are both sides bringing to the table, and what do they expect to get out? We'll start the show with our North America correspondent, John Brain's look at some of the key issues that are likely to be covered during this visit. Their relationship certainly has the occasional hitch, but for the most part, the U.S. President Donald Trump and his Turkish counterpart Recep Tayyip Erdogan appear to enjoy a genuine rapport. Trump regularly refers to Turkey's leader in glowing terms. My honor to be with a friend of mine, somebody I've become very close to in many respects, and uh, he's doing a very good job. But beyond the two presidents themselves, all is not well between their respective countries. Syria is the biggest and most obvious fault line in the relation, but there are other major tensions. Among them is Turkey's purchase of the S-400 missile defense system from Russia. Ankara says it only bought the S-400 because Washington had refused to sell it the American Patriot system, a system it insists it's still willing to acquire if the terms are right. But the Pentagon believes the S-400 could compromise NATO's new F-35 fighter jet by identifying the weak spots in its stealth capabilities. Turkey, a partner in the development of the F-35, has had its participation in the program suspended. Turkey will certainly and regrettably lose jobs and future economic opportunities from this decision. It will no longer receive more than $9 billion in productive in projected work share related to the F-35 over the life of the program. Relations have also been soured by a court action in New York against Halk Bank, one of Turkey's largest banks. It's been accused of operating a scheme to undermine U.S. sanctions on Iran. Halk Bank denies the charges which it claims are politically motivated. But if convicted, it could face fines running into billions of dollars. The yeas are 403, the nays are 16. And then there's the issue of sanctions. The House of Representatives recently voted overwhelmingly in favor of a resolution to bar most weapons sales to Turkey and to freeze the U.S. assets of senior Turkish officials. The Senate is expected to follow suit. Analysts say the U.S.-Turkey tensions have brought about a rare consensus in modern-day American politics. It's really hard in the United States, in this political environment, to get both sides of the political aisle, Democrats and Republicans, unified on anything, even agreeing that it's the sun that's out right now. But they agree that Erdogan has gone too far and that this is a problem. Trump will face pushback for anything he wants to do to reset the relationship with Erdogan. And Trump will already be under considerable pressure on Wednesday. The inquiry into whether he should be impeached is due to move into the public arena, with the proceedings broadcast live on television across the nation. He might find the visit of a fellow leader, a man he describes as a friend, a welcome distraction. John Brain, TRT World, Washington. Let's get some analysis. Luke, what do you expect from this meeting? Well, I think this is going to be a very big meeting, and perhaps it could be one of Donald Trump's most important bilateral meetings of his presidency. What is writing on this meeting is restoring that important U.S.-Turkish relationship that has been a key part of the transatlantic community for seven decades. And granted, for the past seven years or so, it's been rocky, but now is not the time to throw in the towel. Now is the time to double down, uh, re-energize this relationship, try to get everything back on track, because it's important for NATO, it's important for the United States, and it's important for Turkey that this relationship gets back on track. Ali, Luke said it's time to double down. What is Turkey hoping to walk away from? What is it hoping to achieve? 
So Turkey has some issues with United States, especially YPG, PKK, and also trade agreement that Erdogan and President Trump would like to increase the trade value up to $100 billion. So there are a lot of issues that Turkey and United States talk and discuss. And tomorrow's meeting is going to be very critical for the future of the relationship because United States would like to work with Turkey, not Iran and Russia. So it's very important that both leaders talk and uh, agree on the many items. You talked about some of the key issues, but one issue that you have, we haven't talked about right now is the S-400 missile defense system. It's, a, it's an important uh, purchase by Turkey, caused a lot of uh, problems here in Washington. Uh, I'd like to play a bit from the interview that U.S. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien gave on Sunday to CBS's Space the Nation, talking about the S-400 missiles and possible sanctions. Here's what he had to say. If Turkey doesn't get rid of the S-400, I mean, there will likely be sanctions. The CATSA sanctions will, will pass com Congress with an overwhelming bipartisan majority, and Turkey will feel the impact of those sanctions. We've, we've made that very clear to President Erdogan. There's no place in NATO for the S-400. There's no place in NATO for significant Russian military purchases. That's a, a message that the president will deliver to him very clearly when he's here in Washington. So possible sanctions if Turkey activates the S-400. How does Turkey avoid these sanctions? Well, it, it remains to be seen, uh, but there's a lot of wiggle room in the statements coming from various parts of the U.S. government. And also, there's been a little bit of slow walking on the side of, on, on Turkey's side as well when it comes to accepting the delivery of these. It's my understanding, for example, that uh, the missiles themselves haven't been delivered yet for the first battery, just the actual uh, launchers themselves have been delivered. And now the U.S. is talking about um, Turkey can't activate uh, the S-400, and if they agree not to activate, then they can be brought back into the F-35 program, they can get Patriot. This is a key uh, sticking point, and this is the issue that really needs to be resolved when the two leaders meet. President Trump likes to f see himself as this great negotiator, this great um, deal maker. Tomorrow's going to be a challenge for The art of the deal, that's yeah, what exactly. it's all about. Alicia, now, Turkey's paid uh, billions of dollars in this, it said it's a done deal. Can Turkey live with the fact of not activating the system? There is a possibility, actually. I mean, when we look at Senator Graham's statement, if Turkey not activate the S-400, there is a possibility not to have sanctions. It seems like Turkey will have some negotiation with President Trump, and we will see a Patriot missile package offering by President Trump. So I think there, there is a still, I think, open uh, place uh, to negotiate both sides, because if Turkey doesn't activate the S-400, uh, United States will be okay with this. It's, and, and, and the message coming out from the U.S. side is that it's not compatible with the NATO system. But Turkey and the United States have been NATO allies since 1952. And during the Cold War, they were on the same side against the former USSR. Their forces fought together in Korea, collaborated in the Balkans during the 1990s, and then, of course, later on in Afghanistan. But the ensuing policies during the civil war in Syria saw a major split with these longstanding allies, mainly with the U.S. choosing the YPG as their ally on the ground to fight Daesh. Turkey says the YPG is the Syrian offshoot of the PKK, a group which is also recognized as a terror entity by the United States. Our Obeidahito has more from the Turkish-Syrian border. Despite years of criticism from Turkey about what it says is a failed anti-terror policy, the YPG terror group remains America's main ally in the fight against Daesh in eastern Syria. The YPG is the Syrian military wing of the PKK terror group. And it's no secret U.S. Syria experts have been aware of their relationship between their Syrian partners and the PKK. The, uh, we ended up choosing the sworn enemy of the Turks, and the PKK is a, is, is a designated terrorist organization, designated by the State Department, by the United States. We played this terminological game and said, no, it's the YPG, it's the PYD, right. it's the SDF, it's, it's the PKK. U.S. President Donald Trump also says the PKK is as bad as any other terror group. Now, the PKK, which is a part of the Kurds, as you know, is... Uh, probably uh, worse at terror and more of a terrorist threat in many ways than ISIS. Despite operating under an umbrella group known as the SDF, Turkey says their leader, Ferhat Abdi Shahin, is a wanted PKK terrorist nicknamed the son of Ocalan. Ankara says Shahin is responsible for carrying out eight terror attacks in Turkey since 1996, 
which killed over 100 people, including at least 20 children. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan recently asked the U.S. to turn him over following reports the wanted terrorist was invited to visit the White House. The person with the code name Muslim is a terrorist who is wanted with an Interpol red notice. There is an agreement between us and the U.S. regarding the repatriation of the criminals. So the U.S. is supposed to hand this man over to us. Turkey has also asked the U.S. to stop providing support to the YPG and to fulfill their promise agreed to during Vice President Pence's visit to Turkey of removing them from the border areas. But according to President Erdogan, that hasn't happened yet. Neither Russia nor the U.S. has managed to clear those areas from the terrorists on the deadline that they promised. We will be discussing all of this with Trump. The U.S. president initially said U.S. troops would be leaving the area, but instead repositioned them near oil wells in northeast Syria. According to U.S. officials, that oil is being given to the YPG, something Turkey's foreign minister Çavuşoğlu has criticized. We're following U.S. statements closely, and they say openly they're there for the oil resources. We're talking about a country that's not hiding from that fact. Moreover, with the revenues they make from that oil, we see that they support terror groups like the YPG and the PKK. Now Turkey is working with Russia to secure the border areas according to an agreement made in Sochi last month. As Turkey's president made clear, the U.S. did not fulfill its promises, and the YPG have not completely exited the areas agreed upon. That's why Ankara says Operation Peace Spring will continue and Turkey will do whatever is necessary to secure its border. A message that is likely to top the agenda at the meetings between the two leaders in Washington, D.C. Obeidehito, TRT World, on the Turkey-Syria border. Well, what does the United States want in terms of the YPG's role in Syria? Well, this decision by the Obama administration to arm the YPG was doomed to fail from the very beginning. It was always going to end in tears after Daesh was defeated and then the United States was left with, their, with the YPG trying to figure out what the future is going to be. Basically, the U.S. needed ground forces to help defeat Daesh, and the YPG needed the U.S. Air Force to help carve out a little protectorate in northeastern Syria. And I really think the sooner the United States figures out how it's going to disengage with the YPG while ensuring America's security interests are kept in the region, and the sooner we get our relationship back on track with Turkey, the safer and better we will all be in the long run. There's a, there's a seesaw back and forth in terms of, you know, um, our allegiance to the Kurds, we're abandoning the Kurds in northern Yes, Turkey. that's true. There's a lot of emotion behind this. But I can tell you, if more Americans knew that the YPG is essentially a neo-Marxist terrorist organization, they probably wouldn't be too thrilled about America's long-term enduring relationship with them. It was very much a transactional relationship, the foundations of which were started under the Obama administration and continued under Trump. But now we have to move on to the next phase in Syria and figure out a way forward that preserves America's security interests on the ground while fixing our important bilateral relationship with Turkey. And there was a letter that was dated on October the 9th uh, in which President Trump wrote to President Erdogan talking about the YPG, more specifically uh, its leader. And this caused a lot of, um, a lot of tensions in, in Ankara. Um, they said that General Muslim Kobani, which is the leader of the YPG, uh, is ready and willing to negotiate as well as make some concessions. Well, as we just said, it was not well received in Ankara. So who is Muslim Kobani? Well, he may be known by that name, but his real name is Farhat Abdi Shine. But whichever name he goes by, the Turkish government says he's now on Interpol's most wanted list. Muslim Kobani is reportedly the adopted son of the founder of the PKK terrorist organization, Abdullah Öcalan. He joined the PKK as a young teenager and between 2009 and 2012 he's accused of commanding an urban unit of the pkk called tak or tak he's responsible for terror attacks across the country and he's been charged with killing 41 civilians and injuring many more in 2012 Muslim kobani joined the pkk's syrian branch the, the ypg and in 2015 he became the top commander of the syrian democratic forces which is dominated by the YPG. Ali, I want to turn to you. Uh, the United States, in pretty much every uh, official statement giving to the Turks, always says that it understands 
the national security concerns of Turkey. Do they really? I mean, some part, yes, but United States separate PKK from YPG. I mean, they are linked together. They are both terrorist organizations. And unfortunately, at some senior level, uh, they don't understand and they don't want to work with Turkey. But Turkey is a NATO ally. Turkey is very crystal clear what PP, PK, PKK is and what YPG is. So I think with this meeting, President Erdogan again emphasized that PKK and YPG are the same and the United States should not work with the terrorist organizations in Syria. When uh, Vice President Mike Pence was actually giving that press conference in, in Ankara uh, in mid-October, I think it's the first time that the U.S. side actually said, uh, talked about these links um, and said that they need to be cleared from, from the border. So is this possibly uh, a step in the right direction in terms of Turkey's perspective? I think so. I mean, when you look at President Trump, statements he also mentioned about pkk at the white house press briefings so i think white house understand the situation and concern from the turkish side however uh, pentagon at some part they would like to work with ypg pkk in syria and collaborate uh, for the future plans but uh, it's going to be very difficult for turkey to uh, realize and understand for the united states side there is a disagreement, and I don't think it will be solved uh, in a near future. Okay. So the S-400 missile uh, defense crisis is where, as, uh, where the two sides stand on the Syria issue are just uh, some of the issues of this strained relations. But the Turkish president's visit comes obviously off the back of a U.S. House of Representatives resolution that recognizes the events of 1915 involving the killings of Armenians as a genocide a finding that's strongly rejected by Turkey. Now, during the First World War, Armenians in eastern Anatolia living under the Ottoman Empire collaborated with the Russian Empire. When the Armenians turned against their own government with the hostile political aims, the Ottoman Empire subjected the region's population to a relocation. Many died along the way, including Turks and Kurds. Ankara calls the timing of the resolution by the U.S. have House of Representatives, questionable. Turkey says it appears to be punishment for its recent military operation against terrorist groups in northern Syria. Uh, Ali, is this political vengeance? I think so. I mean, it's a political debate, and unfortunately, anti-Turkish groups taken advantage uh, on the political tension between two NATO allies. When we look at 2015, there was a so-called anniversary for uh, genocide, and Armenian diaspora wasn't successful. I mean, the, the Congress didn't pass any resolution, and all of a sudden now they passed the resolution at the House side. So it seems like they just took an advantage uh, and uh, have a support from some members of Congress and passed the uh, legislation. However, it doesn't mean that you know Turks will accept. It's a political debate. Let the historian decide. Politicians should not even on this case. And that's, that's a line that President Erdogan has always said. Let's open our books, our, our records, and let historians and scholars to decide what really happened. Uh, Luke, this is a resolution that really generally comes up uh, every year uh, around April. Exactly. Um, but this year's come up a little bit earlier. Yeah. Uh, from the U.S. side, talk to us a little bit about the timing. Well, it's come up twice this year, in fact, because it did come up in April, and now we have it again. And this was uh, politically driven, this timeline. Uh, without a doubt, uh, it, you know, Congress uh, has been toying with this idea for, for years, uh, and this uh, resolution never made it out of the committee stage. All of a sudden, in November, uh, it gets a full vote on the floor of the House and passes overwhelmingly. So clearly this was, uh, uh, I would say, politically driven to send certain messages to Ankara. But as a, as a limited government conservative that I am, I am very uncomfortable with the idea of, of our congressmen and women legislating history. Mm -hmm. They should be focusing on proving uh, the U.S. economy, on boosting jobs, on fixing our broken health care system, not about legislating something that happened more than 100 years ago. Okay, fair point. Well, a lot of the issues that we've been discussing here today uh, have happened fairly, fairly recently, but without a doubt, one of the most longstanding and contentious issues between the two countries is the extradition of Fethullah Gülen, the leader of the FETO terrorist organization. Turkey holds him responsible for the July 2016 attempted coup that left more than 250 people dead and more than 2,000 injured. Our diplomatic correspondent, Hassan Abdullah, has more from Ankara.
after the coup in 2016 failed, the Turkish government targeted those it holds responsible, the FETÖ terrorist organization. Those targets were at home and abroad, and some countries extradited FETÖ suspects to Turkey. But its leader and many senior members still haven't been taken into custody. The head of this terrorist organization has been living in the U.S. since 1999. Why are they keeping him there, even after our justice ministry has sent them 90 files on him? Why is he so valuable to them? We have to ask ourselves these questions. Washington says Turkey has failed to meet the burden of proof, and so it cannot extradite FETÖ's leader, Fethullah Gülen. I think the accusations of the Turkish government that Mr. Gülen is the head of a terrorist, a terrorist organization are severe accusations, so there's a high level of threshold that needs to be uh, met when it comes to proving that uh, he has been involved. But the Turkish government argues that threshold has been met and blames Washington's apparent reluctance on their political differences. American media say attorney Rudy Giuliani has repeatedly urged Donald Trump to extradite Fatullah Gulen. Even the president himself has reportedly questioned why the US should not extradite the Fatullah leader. For many in Ankara, the answer is obvious. They accuse the Americans of protecting an ally who they think could be used against the Turkish government. Hassan Abdullah, TRT World, Ankara. Alishina, are we likely to see any progress in the extradition of Fethullah Gülen? I doubt it. I mean, President Trump uh, is working on it. I mean, he always says that to President Erdogan and they have a phone call. They are looking into it, but it seems like there is no progress. And President Erdogan will ask again the status of the extradition of Fethullah Gülen. But I don't think that we'll see any resolution or outcome uh, out of this extradition process. Uh, unfortunately, U.S. media also supporting FETO, and then they are working uh, with un other anti-Turkish groups. So I highly doubt that we'll see any resolution or outcome on the FETO issue. And it's very sad as a Turkish American that you know FETO groups are doing a smear campaign against Turkey, which they don't represent Turkey anymore, and this is also hurting the relationship between two NATO allies. Luke. Uh the Turkish side has said that we've provided more than 90 boxes of evidence to the U.S. Justice Department. I guess this isn't enough evidence for them to sort of um, accelerate the extradition process then. They, they don't seem convinced. Well, as Ali said, uh, this issue is unlikely to get resolved during this visit. And I am equally puzzled as to why this process is taking so long. I understand there's a huge uh, legal process and, and the United States government can often at times be a huge bureaucracy. But it seems like uh, we get the message of we're looking into this issue over and over again for years. And uh, as long as this issue remains unresolved, then there will always be this uh, issue simmering in the background of U.S.-Turkish relations. We can get S-400 on track. We can get the Syria issue on track. But we are going to have this Gulen issue always in the background. So we've talked about the S-400 F-35 Patriot missile defense system and Turkey's possible purchase of it. We've talked about Syria, we've talked about Fethullah Gülen, as well as the, uh, the, the, um, the, the House bill uh, regarding the, the mass killings of the Armenians in Eastern Anatolia. What, one final note from each of you, what's the one thing that actually we can get achieved between these two sides to get relations back on track? Well, I think we can see these two leaders get back around the same table and start to look at a way forward to bring U.S.-Turkish relations closer like they used to be. We need small deliverables. We need to find achievable goals. We, need, we shouldn't worry about the big issues like Gulen or the future of Syria right now. We should be finding ways to boost the confidence between both sides. Ali Chinash, Luke talks about small deliverables. What are these small deliverables? I think trade is important also. Both leaders would like to increase the trade volume up to $100 billion. And I think it's achievable. U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other business organizations are working really hard to increase the trade volume. So I think this will be another big topic uh, to achieve. And if Turkey doesn't activate the S-400 missile defense system, if it's brought back into the F-35 uh, fighter jet program, and the purchase of this possible Patriot missile, uh, missiles, then possibly could go away towards achieving this $100 billion trade, uh, trade volume. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here in thank Washington. You. I do appreciate your insight and 
analysis. Well, this wraps up our special look at President Erdogan's visit. I'd like to thank our guests, Luke Coffey and Ali Chinar, for their analysis and insight. Don't forget to tune in to our rolling coverage of President Erdogan's visit to the U.S. Capitol starting at 1600 GMT on Wednesday. From me, Ali Janayandar, thank you and goodbye from Washington.